we're going to start dealing with the keyboard now. So I have information on the keyboard. OK, so it's basically using ports, so we're going to have to set up ports. After looking through the, the way this works, this Z80 emulator, the port space is dealt with the same way as memory. It uses the same interface. So I can't use the same class for ports as I can for memory. Well, I could, but there's no way the class would be able to tell the difference between a request for an I.O. port or memory. I'll have to set up another class to do that, to relay that. The way this thing executes, right, it's going, when this function is called, it's going to execute a bunch of instructions and then it's going to return. Then there's going to be a pause. Then it's going to execute another bunch of instructions. But if I'm trying to detect key presses, right, if I press the key press during the pause and let it go during the pause, you know, and if you hit a key fast, that could very well happen the key up and key down event will occur inside the pause between the two uh, calls to this function and thus the spectrum emulator isn't going to see that key press so I'm going to need to buffer the key depressions and I think the way to do that is just to set up a simple int buffer so that's what I'm going to do now let's create a new class and I suppose I could do this as a to use any uh, any type but I'll just use an int for now. So we'll set up a previous value um, public int buffer and we're going to set up a initial value. We'll default that to zero. Previous value is equal to initial value. Now we'll set up a list of ints. That's going to be our buffer. If we get a value so we'll do this as properties here. Yeah? Public get uh, int. Okay. Uh, get. Actually, what we'll do is we'll call this uh, value. So if we get a value, we need to check if there's anything in the buffer. Okay. So if buffer dot count is greater than zero, then int i equals buffer dot element at zero buffer dot remove at zero and return i otherwise we return the previous value and setting we just need to add the value to the buffer so that's going to be buffer dot add value we might need to get the last one so let's set up another property blast value and we only need to get this so get if buffer count is greater than zero otherwise return previous value and in here we're going to return buffer element at buffer dot count minus one so in actual fact when we set it we can set uh, previous value to be equal to value okay and then return here you can just return previous value right okay that simplifies that so as we put values into this it acts like a queue and when we pull them out with get it pulls out the next one in the queue until there's none left and then it will just send that value okay and that will allow us to buffer the key presses from um, from key events we're also going to need to set up interrupts because it won't be able to scan the script because it scans the script uh, it scans the keyboard on an interrupt cycle so we're also going to need to implement the interrupt which is uh, z80 interrupt source okay value on data bus well we're just going to put 255 there for now i don't think we really need to bother with that int line is active is the the critical one so we're going to need another bool for an interrupt request so private bool inlq equals false okay so int line is active if irq then irq equals false so we clear the um, we clear the request and then we can return true to signal back to the z80 to trigger an interrupt Otherwise, we can just return false for no interrupt. That should deal with that. 
and then on fire interrupt here we can just set IRQ to be true. We're going to need something to deal with IO requests. Let's create a new class and we'll call this port space and this is also going to implement I memory. Okay, size 65536. Oh, I forgot about these set contents. I don't think they're important for now. I think they might have something to do with block shift instruction. I really don't know. We'll deal with it if it becomes a problem. So this is what's happening with the port spaces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up other aspect of core down here. What have I done that for? Okay. Private void init IO. Core we need to call init IO. So in here we need to put port space, port space, all right, oh I th something I forgot I think, we need to register the interrupts, so CPU register interrupt source this, that's it, okay back to here. So we don't really want to receive these messages up here. We want them sort of down here. We'll set a constructor. So get returns a value and takes one parameter. So that's going to be a function. So func, so yeah, the parameter it takes is an int and it returns a byte. And that's going to be a get request and an action which takes an int and a byte has two parameters uh, set so down here two functions so private port in okay that returns a byte and it takes an int as an address just set that for default by now and we've got private void port out int address comma byte value okay so in port space we can send in port in and port out so up here we've got private action int byte now this is set and private func int byte is get okay so get becomes uh, get address and set becomes set address comma value and get equals get set equals set I'll fold that class up now that should be okay that should pass the um, port in and port out functions to these methods here just to test this out we're going to set the border a different color so Let's go into our core here where we're setting the border color. So let's set this to some crazy value like four. Okay, so we should get, yeah, we've got a green border. If we look at this information, we can see the border color is transferred in port FE, which is 254 on an output. So if our system is working here, this should come through here. So we can say if address is equal to 254, border color is going to be equal to, and that's the value and 7. Okay. So let's see. What's this? Right. Not fond of that. Let's suppress that. There we go. Got rid of that. Now go away. So hopefully the border should change from green back to white, which it has. All right, so that's working. All right, we need to send key press events into the core. But the thing with key up and key down is with key down, if you press a key and leave your finger on the key, it will send multiple key down events. And we don't want that. So we need to suppress that from happening. So before we go any further here, Let's just set handle true, so 
we don't need to worry about anything else messing around with it so when the key goes down let's create a hash set of keys uh, key states okay so key states equals new hash set keys so on key down we're going to add the key to the hash set okay but we're only going to handle this if key states contains e dot key code and if it doesn't contain it then we'll add it so uh, key states dot add e dot key code and then similarly up here key states dot remove e dot key code and this way uh, we won't it won't send duplicate key presses you know when you leave your finger on the key let's go over into the core and we want the port space one this is what's dealing with io and we'll have a key press this needs to be public key press and keys key and then the state so whether it's down or up here we're going to go core dot key press and that's e dot keys key code and this is down so this is true and then here this one is false so now we can deal with the key press now the thing is we've got some data here on the keyboard i'm going to probably have to set up a key map for this so i'm thinking the best way is to set up a dictionary to record the key against the port and then use and then use an, another collection probably another dictionary so that we can retrieve the state of the key so we're going to need a key map and a key state collection we want a private there's going to be a dictionary we're recording a key against and this is going to be a, a two value integer where one of them will record the bit in the table and the other one will record the port uh, that's the key map and we're also going to need a key state and this one is going to be an int for the port number and the last one is going to be an int buffer because remember we need to buffer the key presses and that's key state so key map equals new dictionary keys int now we need to enter the data so key map keys dot so the first one is shift and that's going to be equal to new int and we want fe fe and that's bit zero which is going to be a one because we'll use it as a mask so that's shift the next one in this is the letter z so that's keys dot z and in this case it's two so i'm going to go ahead and do all of these off camera i'll skip over it because there's quite a few okay there's all the keys in the key map so now we need to do the key states key state dictionary in buffer and the key states and what we're doing is adding each of the port numbers so that's fe fe is equal to new in buffer and we're using the first five bits so that's one f because the the bit logic is inverted here a zero means the key is pressed a one means it's not as is generally the case with ports so one two three four five six seven eight so we have fe fe fdfe okay there we go so as a key comes in we need to see if the key is in our um, key map so if key map contains key and that's going to be key okay right then we can get the port so int port is equal to key map key and bit okay so port is uh, the first one the key map key zero and the bit this key is one okay so now we need to get the key state so it's the int buffer for the key so int buffer k 
ks is equal to key state port. Then we need to get the previous value of key state. So int last value is ks dot last value. So if the key is down, so if down last value, we need to clear the bit. We need to make the bit zero. So that's going to be, we need to invert our bit. Uh, we're going to end that with this. So invert our bit and 1f for the first five bits. Otherwise, we're going to or with bit and not x1f. So that should set our key state. But one thing I have to do here is because this is going to be accessed by more than one thread. Okay, I'm going to have to lock. Yeah, I'm going to have to lock on the int buffer, I think. Yeah, so lock on ks. And of course, ks.value is equal to last value to put the modified information back in. So that will deal with the key presses and will set the relevant bits as we need them. So now we need to set up the spectrum being able to read those. So this is key state. So if key state contains key address, okay, then this is a keyboard read. So we need to get the int buffer for the address. And now we need to lock on it. And we need to get that value back. So it's just return. Oh, sorry, this is port in, isn't it? Not port out. Port in. So we lock on the int buffer and we return ks.value. Uh, that needs to be a byte. So let's see if our keyboard works. No, it doesn't seem to be. Okay, let's make sure we're getting keyboard events. So Okay, we need the output window. There we go. Yeah, well, keys are definitely coming through. So what's happening with port in? Console.writeline address. This is going to spam the console window, but uh, don't need to do it for long. So let's see what address that's trying to read. So it should be doing nothing other than reading the keyboard at that boot up stage. So we'll see what ports it's sending through. 254. Okay, that ain't right because it should be sending, um, the address should be these, should be 16, it's only sending the last eight bits. So something's not right there. Okay, this looks like it might be an issue with the, the Z80 emulator code. So I'm going to go and investigate what's happening here. I'll be back. Okay, here's the problem. You can see here, byte port number. That's why it's only 8-bit. Now the Z80, this, this really isn't correct because the Z80 on this instruction up here uh, in RC, it will put... It doesn't put C on the address bus, just the eight bits of C. It puts BC, it puts the register pair BC on the address bus. And that's what's used by the spectrum here. Fortunately, this is open source. So I should be able to just, I can just grab this code and, and fix it, hopefully. So let's have a look here. We'll get the latest version and we'll download this. Z80.net 1.07 zip. Okay, so here's the solution. So what I'm going to do, I could include it as another project, but I'm not going to bother. So I'm just going to save this one, and then we'll open this project and see what we can do. Okay, let's configure this. We need a release. We don't want the... Wow! You hear my laptop fan going? Okay, we only want to compile main. So let's take a look at what we have to adjust here so let's start with the interface so that's read from port 
Okay, on dependencies interfaces. There we go. And we want IZAT processor agent. Read from port. Okay. So this needs to be a sh U short. And so does write to port. Okay, we should get errors if we try and build that. Z80 processor does not implement. Okay. This needs to be U short. Write to port U short. Cannot convert from U short to byte. Get port access mode. Okay, so we're going to need that in the interface, which I believe is the main interface here. U short. Get port wait states. We also need to make those changes here. And what was the other one? Port access mode. Yep. So the port space size is going to be larger. Okay, that builds okay. Uh, we also need to change the instruction, I think. It's in RC we need to change. So where's that? Instruction execution, instructions. In RC, that's the one we want. Yeah, here, registers, see? Um, that needs to be BC. And also, I think, why is that not liking that? Read from port, use short. Oh, that's just a, right, okay. So we need to cast it to, okay, so it's auto-generated. So let's close that. Yeah, he's done it just to, to save, uh, to auto-generate each register. So BC and cast to use short. Yeah, I, know. I trust him. Okay, there we go. Build, build. Okay, let's just make sure we get a clean build here. So, clean and build. All right. So, there's our DLL, which is hopefully fixed. So let's close this. And I'll open our Spectrum project again. Okay, here we are in our Spectrum project. And I'm just going to put the DLL in here. And we'll open this. Wow. I don't know what Visual Studio does that requires the processor to spin so much. When you first open a project, it's ridiculous. So let's go into our package manager here. And we're going to remove the Z80. Okay, that's gone. And of course, that's going to cause a load of errors because we've no, we no longer got any assembly for that stuff. But not to worry. We'll add a reference, browse, and there's my work folder. And we'll select the DLL. And okay. And hopefully all those errors should go away. Yep. Do we get a successful build? We do. Okay, this is looking good. Uh, where were we here? We're in port space, aren't we? Okay, so we're still reporting on the addresses coming in. So hopefully those addresses now should be 16-bit with any luck. Yes, there we go. Look. Okay, so I'll get rid of that report. And let's see if we've got some keyboard action. Oh yes, looks like our flash isn't working properly. Oh, I haven't set the timer, have I, to make it flash? Okay, so flash inverts. So we need to set up a timer, private timer, flash timer, and then in init we'll say flash timer equals new timer flash timer dot tick that's the flash timer and that's just going to invert so flash invert equals not flash invert flash timer dot start and hopefully we should now get a flashing cursor there we go all right turn print uh, you know, I don't know where, where all the keys are. Just a second while I find a Spectrum keyboard layout. 
Okay, here we go. So P. So I think I did symbol shift with control, I think, if I remember rightly. So control P. Yep, yeah, there we go. Oops. What did I just do? Uh, backspace, delete, shift zero. Yeah, okay. So ten. I had one of these computers as a kid. Bloody hell. Okay, try again. Hello world. I must have typed in getting on for a hundred programs into this thing. Yeah, I don't know what any of these symbols are. That'll do. <laughs> the semicolon. What's a semicolon? No, oh, that's a comma. Wow. I think it's the O. It's difficult to see with the red on that. Let's try. Yep, that's one. 20. Go to 10. Run. Whoa. I wonder what will happen if we save that. Okay. Obviously, we can't hear anything because we haven't. Uh... Hmm. We haven't set up the audio yet, but uh... yeah, so far so good. All right. So let's start looking at the way the audio out. You know, I've just decided that doing this in partial bits is not good. <laughs> I don't like it. I thought I'd experiment with it, but I don't. I don't like it. I should really have split things up into classes. Ah, oh, well, well, we've started now. So, audio out. Okay. Waveformer. There we go. Length. Right. Now, this is going to be continually playing, right? So we want the underlying operator, operating system to think it's never going to end. So we're going to put in long.max value. So that'll just keep it going forever. Position. Well, let's set up a position variable. Private int pos equals zero. Oh, sorry, it's a long, isn't it? Get pos set will throw not implemented because it shouldn't be in, implemented. And read here. Okay. Actually, we'll call this position. So we need to go through every byte. So for int i equals zero, i is less than count, i plus plus. And we're also going to need something to record the current state of the speaker. So, so this is whatever value we're going to return in the audio buffer. And remember, the spectrum is a very, very simple square wave type deal. So this doesn't need to be complex. So bytes, we'll call this. Um, SPK value for speaker value. Okay, and normally for just being quiet, it's in the middle of the wave, so that's one to eight. Okay, and we can return count there. Okay, so buffer i is going to be equal to our speaker value. But of course, we're going to need to change the speaker value depending on what's happening earlier in the IO area. So let's go into port space, which is dealing with IO, and have a look at how it happens on port out, I believe. So let's just take a look at the information for that. All right, here we are. We're not going to, like, we're just emulating a 48K at the moment, not a Spectrum Plus or anything like that. So we can forget about the AY chip for now. Might look at that a bit later on, maybe in another video or whatever, or an update to this one. Okay, the beeper is controlled by rapidly, rapidly toggling bit 4 of port FE. Now, I think there's more to it than that. I think there's two bits because you've got a mic and an ear port. So let's see if we can find some more information on that. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's happening here. We've got bits 3 and 4 of FE. So what I'm going to do, I think I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to have to compromise here that bit 4 is the ear port and bit 3 is the mic port. I think. No, yeah, bit four is the ear, bit three is the mic. A mic, the output from the mic port is generally quieter than from the ear port. So what I'll do is if I shift this right by three bits, I'll end up with either zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. And I can use that as the volume. 
So 11000, hex 18. Okay, and we need a speaker. Okay, so private int speaker zero. Okay, so here we can say speaker is equal to, what do we say, hex 18. So that's value and not x18 for bits three and four. Okay, so we're going to shift this left by another bit, I think. And that will basically give us the volume of the speaker, depending on that. Now we also need to record when that speaker event took place, because this needs to be timed pretty well. Instructions are being executed in one big block, right? So if we did it in real time, the audio would sound all strange because you'd have a lot of clicks all together and then a big gap. We need to record the actual clock, the T states which have passed before the speaker changed. And then we need to interpret that when we're playing back the sound through the wave out device so that they occur at the same the same time. There'll be a little bit of latency, but you can't really avoid that. We'll try and minimize that as much as we can. So let's record last speaker here. Then we'll change the speaker with that. And then we'll say if speaker is not equal to last speaker, then we've had a, basically a speaker event. So let's create something to store the speaker events. So private. Uh, this is going to be a list of ulongs because we need to store the the t states when it happened and this is spk events okay then we need to record that speaker event ah actually thinking about it okay so we'll shift this right by three bits so we need to take the cpu t states since start Okay, and then we need to shift this left by two bits. U long uh, T states. Then we need to all that with our speaker value. So all that with speaker, which should just be the last two bits. Okay, we'll have to cast that to U long, I think. Oh, no, because it doesn't. U int. Thank you. So what we're doing here is we're creating a value which is recording not only the time in which the event is supposed to occur but also the value of that event so that we can chuck that now into speaker events so speaker events dot add t state actually i'll call that s state speaker state uh, also i'm gonna have to lock on that because it's going to be a different thread accessing it lock on speaker events then add it okay so that's going to record our audio event. So now we need to, on audio in, on audio out, sorry, we need to extract that information and then put it in the right place here. Now this is where things get tricky. We'll create a function called speaker changer. And then for every sample that we're putting into the sample buffer, we'll run speaker changer. Okay. So we need to keep track of how many samples we're actually, that we've done. A sample count okay and then we'll add one to that so sample count plus plus so we're going to be in two states whether we're actually waiting for a speaker change to occur or whether we're like in an idle state let's create uh, a flag to tell us that so we've got bool we'll call this waiting for change and this is false by default so at the top of here we'll say if we're not waiting for change, then we'll do this or we'll do that. So if we're waiting for a change, we need to pull the next value out of the speaker buffer. So we're going to need to lock on speaker events. So if there are no events in there, then we can just return. We don't need to do anything. Otherwise, we need to. So we're going to need to set up a few long next for the next event. And in here we can say next is equal to speaker events dot element at zero. And then we can remove at zero. Okay, so if we get through to here, we, we're on a new event that we need to handle. So let's get the, uh, the next speaker state. So this is going to be the state that occurs when the event 
should happen. So let's make that a byte. So private byte next speaker value. So we need to extract what the value of the speaker is going to be. So that's the last two bits of next, remember. So if we take uh, next speaker value, that's going to be equal to next and three. Okay. That will give us uh, zero, one, two, or three. So if we multiply that by 10, that will give us a nice range of sounds. And then we need to cast that to a byte. Rotate that right so that we can get the actual clock cycles that we need. Now we need to work out at what sample count we need to activate that change. So we'll, we'll have to create another one here. So private u long sample change is equal to zero. Sample change is going to be next divided by our speed. But just to make sure it gets that properly, we'll cast both of these to doubles and then we'll cast the whole lot back to an U long afterwards. Okay, so that's when the sample will change. And then we can just set the flag waiting for change is equal to true. So next time it will come down into this one. So all we need to do here is if, if our sample count is greater than or equal to uh, change so sample change waiting for change is equal to false and a speaker value is now equal to our next speaker value so that should do that hopefully we might have to introduce some kind of latency here so let's create one for that so private view long sound latency equals Let's give it a thousand and see how we go with that. We can adjust that. Plus uh, sound latency. So we need to get this sound thing to play. Let's create an init. Call. We need to call init audio out before audio in. Okay. So audio out is going to be running slightly ahead of the processor so we are going to need to figure out some kind of latency there we need to start playing out through the speaker basically so what have we got just give me a second while i go and look up what i'm supposed to do here um looks like i need to set up a wave out event okay. and we can set the desired i'm going to set this pretty low if it gives us a problem we'll increase it and this is a different latency to what we did here. Uh, this is for, because this is running slightly ahead, the, the latency here just involves the size of this buffer here. Okay, now we need to initialize it with the stream. And the stream is basically this class. So wave out dot init this and start it playing. So I'm going to do this in a new task. So task dot run wave out play. Let's see if we've got some sound. Mm, does it seem so? It's actually running. Yep. Are we getting any events happening? Yep. Have I got any volume? Yep. Okay, let's check if we're having a speaker change. So if I put a breakpoint there and create some sound. No, okay. So no events are firing. So what's happening here? Let's have a look in port space. Let's see if we get any action in there. Yep, okay. That's a keyboard click, isn't it, I think. So we are having, let's have a look at What's happening there then? Okay, it is putting things into there. Wow! Oh! Oh, it looks like it's just lagged. Oh, okay.
Okay, well that <laughs> certainly isn't right. So what's happening there? Oh, right. I'm doing that in the wrong place, aren't I? Okay, let's try that now. Oh, okay. Alright, that doesn't seem right. Let's try increasing the latency then. Let's try 2000. Okay, that didn't make much difference. Let's go up a bit more. Let's try 5000. Nope. Wow, okay. 7000. Okay, that's not doesn't seem to be making much difference. When it was really, really badly lagged, the sound sounded okay, it was just very low pitched. Okay, let's make a real big delay. So hundred thousand. Okay, that sounds right to me. So it's just a question of getting this latency right, I think. Let's try 50,000. Okay, that's way too late. 25. Okay, that seemed pretty good. Let's go down to 20. And we'll keep going down until we start getting audio... Um, problems okay that seemed okay as well let's try 15,000 yeah that's not good I can tell by the key click yeah no uh, 175 and try and get this as, as low as possible Right. Let's try one eight five. Okay, that seems okay. So a latency of one eight five, because I think we can work this out from the from the speed and everything. So if we take our base frequency, which is ninety six thousand. Okay, so ninety six thousand. We'll divide that by 18500, gives us 5. Alright, seems logical enough. So let's sacrifice a little here and we'll go with base frequency divided by 5. Uh, we need to go to a. And that should let us change the base frequency and everything. Okay, I'm happy with that. Let's see if the beep command works. Now I need to just give me a second while I figure out what how to get where beep is on the keyboard. Okay, right. Okay, beep. And it's duration first, so we'll go three seconds, a comma, and let's try twenty. Okay, beep, three seconds, comma, let's go lower, let's go 10. Okay, that seems to be working. Alright, so the only thing left to do is the audio input.